You know, I always thought to myself, being a smaller YouTuber gives me the unique opportunity to uh, engage with folks on a more uh, personal level. And one of those is being able to remember and retain comments and requests for certain videos. And in my latest My Top 5, not my latest, but one of my more recent My Top 5 videos, everyone requested the Mad Dog. Well, this is in that video. So welcome, everyone, to the Transol C160 by Azur Poly. This is a twin-engined light transport aircraft made in a joint venture by the French and German governments in operation for over 50 years, according to the little splash card that I read while it was loading. And uh, it was requested by exactly one person. So we're gonna we're gonna take a look at it today. I'm gonna let you know now. I love this airplane. It is what I think all developers should strive to shoot for. It is not fully ready to go yet, um, as far as uh, FMC implementation and that sort of thing. But what is on the table right now, I think, has the moniker for something great. So nonetheless, we're gonna give this aircraft a full review like we normally would. We're going to first and foremost start with looking at textures. From there, we'll take a look in the cargo hold. We'll take a listen to some of the switches and sounds inside of the aircraft. And then obviously last, we will get it in the air, get some flight impressions, and look at some of the party tricks that this aircraft has. Without further ado, let's begin. So beginning the Transol C-160 tour, with textures as always, and I am happy to report that I am very pleasantly um, enamored with a lot of the textures on this airplane. Um, I only have about, I don't know, five or so hours of flight time on it, but uh, the textures definitely never let me down. I think if anything, the livery um, pack that this aircraft comes with kind of lets it down, um, and we'll see more of that momentarily, but I mean, everything looks relatively up to scratch. You've got a nice 3D modeled wing light there. Down below on the nose gear, we'll come back to that in just a second. Um, same deal with the axi light looking nicely modeled. On the nose gear, we've got the chocks and uh, blockages and probes and stuff in place, but the nose gear, great detail for the most part all around. Um, a repeating theme that I'm seeing with some of the newer add-ons to the Sims, the weathering actually, if anything else, takes a little bit away from it. At a distance it all looks fine, but uh, up close it does get a little bit drabby. Great detail on those individual wheel nuts. And obviously good detail up in the gear bay as well. Love to see that zinc chromate or whatever they're using in airplanes now. Color and the appropriate shadowing and such in the nose gear bay. Continuing our ground level approach down the center line of the aircraft, I actually don't know what purpose these guys serve. Are they drains? Someone will have to let me know in the comments, but there's quite a few of them down the entire bottom side of the fuselage, accompanied by a, uh, what looks to be a VHF antenna, and I'm assuming that is a receiver, or maybe it's a transceiver for the radar altimeter on this aircraft couple more inline antennas when we come over to the main landing gear which look exceptionally well in my opinion again very few details spared you got a great big APU exhaust there as well um, let's actually hop back into the cockpit cockpit momentarily and we'll get into all of this but this is good I'm gonna turn on our EFB yes this airplane has one it's not great but it's uh, it's a good starter EFB, and as I have continually said, some EFB is better than no EFB, PMDG, and uh, we love to see it even if it is a basic one. So one of the things you can do in the EFB is you can now see the main landing gear door is partially raised. Um, I'm not sure what purpose this serves outside of maybe ground servicing or something but you can do it and it lets you really appreciate some of the smaller details inside of the gear you've got these nice what i'm assuming are hydraulic hoses for the braking system this really unique looking uh uh trailing brace strut system on the gear 
different to something like the C17, for example. Got good detail on the inside. You can see what looks to be a nice brake rotor as well as, I believe, these guys here are for the anti-skid system, or maybe it's part of the braking system. Someone more familiar with the aircraft will have to let me know. Come through the center here. I mean, all in all, I think the detail there is more than good enough. Come up to the rear. The uh, side doors here do open either side. We can look at those momentarily later on in the tour. Coming back up to the front of the fuselage, we'll take a look at the lighting for the refueling probe. Again, a nice 3D model there, and those look really good when they're lit up at night. Um, this aircraft comes with a few different variants. We currently have the French Air Force variant, but there is a Luftwaffe variant, a South African variant, a Red Cross variant, an Air France variant, um, and a couple more that I'm forgetting, and they do actually add and subtract the probe that you guys are seeing as uh, is applicable for that aircraft. So if the probe's gone, you won't have those AAR lights either. Uh, the other switch that I flipped was the door for the APU inlet. So that is the APU inlet right there. Got that door that swings open and uh, obviously the outlets there. Proprietary GPU, not the highest texture looking thing, but it's good enough, gets the job done. It's better than having nothing there at all, which some other aircraft do. Looking down the top side of the fuselage, again, just kind of more the livery of the aircraft, letting it down more than anything else. The finer details, as far as texturing goes, all look good to me. Good reflections on the windows. What I'm assuming is a nice loop antenna running up to the tail there. Props all look relatively good at a reasonable distance. If you get up close and personal with them, they do. Again, the weathering kind of lets them down a little bit, but uh, at any reasonable distance, they look pretty good. Um, I'll spare you the sample test today, but uh, just know that on the back side of our um, turboprop, there isn't anything really to show. It's just a black uh, cap a few feet uh, behind our cover there. So nothing really to see. Again, the weathering kind of letting us down a little bit, in my opinion. But you step a little ways away, and it does look relatively good. Oh, why did I say good so loud? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. Coming out to the outboard wing now. Got ground power on, so we do have our nav light illuminated ever so nicely. Very nice looking nav light. Again, just more of that weathering texture letting us down. I like the pre, uh, not pre rays, but the uh, separation you can see between those pneumatic boots looks good. And then we have a split wing, and by split wing, I mean top and bottom air brake, which is very nicely detailed, very nicely textured. Even have the details of the uh, yellow, assuming. Those are hydraulic rams to push them up. A little bit of detail lost. I think that uh, piston running right here might be silver, but I've actually never seen this aircraft in person, so I can't say for certain. And then this aircraft uses both an aileron and a spoiler on the top side of the wing, either side for control. So left wing down, you want to spoil all that lift, you'll dump that spoiler. With the speed brakes retracted, it only utilizes that outboard spoiler as well. So these are essentially going to be kind of like dive brakes, and we will take a look at a tactical approach later on in the flight. More the same, the one 2D texture for lighting I was able to find exists in the formation lights. It's these blue guys along the length of the wing so you can see another one out there another two out there actually one two um, and there's a couple down the spine so those are the only 2d lighting textures i was able to find externally on the aircraft there's not a whole lot to complain about i mean look at the nice detail on those phillips head screws all in all i think this is a 
very well uh, textured aircraft. I just think the liveries need a little bit of work. You can even see if we get uh, down low and zoom in, get personal, you can see, I think that's a texture effect, but it looks almost like you can see the rippling in the skin on the horizontal stabilizer. But that might just be texturing, fancy texturing work. Single nav light on the tail. A little bit of a graphical bug there. It looks like if we zoom out, does it uh, come to life? Not really. We gotta come out to like here before you see it. And then when you zoom back in, it goes away. I'm assuming below that is a fuel drain, maybe? Not entirely certain. Someone will have to let me know. And then we come to the tail portion again, just kind of the texture kind of letting it down. Those are uh, uh, not 470, 80. What are the 100 degree countersunk rivets? Whole bunch of those. Um, I think the textures on those, even though they are countersunk and are meant to be flush, I think the texturing could use a little bit of uh, increased work, especially when you look at stuff on the edge here. It's like on the edge of the rudder. Um, that texture is really low quality and also the rivet split in half. Okay. Doesn't quite make sense to me, but uh, maybe that's just me being nitpicky. Nice Transol C160 branding on the tail. And then we have one of our two anti-collision lights, the other one being underneath the right main landing gear fairing. I'll show that real quick. There it is. Or other anti-collision lights. So interesting positioning on the anti-collision lights for the aircraft. But uh, gets the job done, I suppose, so no harm, no foul. Let's uh, hop inside of the transol next and uh, see what the cockpit's got going on. All right, and on board the uh, C-160 now, we'll go ahead and get a little bit of uh, panel lighting going so you can see what it uh, looks like in a generally lower light environment. There's our side, the FO side as well. And our center console. This is a, I like this aircraft primarily just because it's something different. Um, those of you familiar with general aircraft functions will know kind of what I'm talking about. It's almost kind of like you, know, you learn the basics of one, you learn most of them, um, and that's not to sound pompous, it just, it's just kind of how it works. Um, so, Okay, so there's a little bit of uh, lighting on the whole cockpit situation. We'll come back to that uh, electronic flight bag in a moment. But let's uh, come over here take a look at man that looks really good in the sun doesn't it and so oh, and there's our alignment complete so aside from this little strip here which for those of you guys who remember crts i could 100 percent see this being a uh, real representation of a crt at an off axis but maybe that needs that little strip there but i mean who's 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 looking at it from any other angle than this when you're flying right um, I love these instruments, so um, I'm not sure where this is going to come out, but I did a review of the P-40 earlier today, and when I was saying the instruments weren't bad, but they didn't have um, just what it took to make it a perfect 10, these are an example of, I, I would say, some of the best steam gauges in the sim. They're crystal clear. You can see there's 3D aspects to all of them. They've got, you know, scratches and dirt on the lenses over them. They, they just look good. And then the CRTs for each display look good. You know, I would almost say if you got the um, CRT style overlays, like where you can actually see the little pixels, like the old CRTs had, like the, uh, um, who makes it? Aerosoft CRJ. If they have that overlay on these, I would say these are probably some of the best CRT um representations on the sim personally that's you know my tank but I, that's that's what i think 
get a little bit of sun on them and they look even better. Again, you can see the differentiation in the 3D texturing. I mean, you omit a few things like this adjustment knob here looks a little bit funky. And I mean, this is darn near wallpaper quality. I, I don't know. I'm, have I lost it officially? Probably. Altimeter looks great with that little bit of sun across the uh, LCD display mixed in with the analog gauge. All of your switches and buttons have that nice, uh, excuse me, that nice weathering overlay on them. Let's get some of this lighting on as well so you can see a little bit of backlighting on the cockpit. Yeah, I don't know. They just look good. And then you, like I was saying before, you add a little bit of light to them as well. Um, they just, I don't know. They, they just really, really pop. They do it for me. I, I really like these instruments, even at a distance, but especially up close. They make for very good uh, Phoenix stuff. You guys saw in the announcement video that I did for this, I did a nice sweeping shot uh, across the instrument panel. And uh, good, high-quality instruments like this make that easy. So, three different lighting modes that you probably saw. Um, you've got white light, ultra ultraviolet, and then green for tactile stuff. Um, this is going to be your FMC. It is not currently fully functional. Um, I think you can do some really basic stuff in it. Um, right now, let's hop over to the one I turned on earlier. Um, so there's a little bit of stuff that you can do with it, but, uh, not a whole lot. You know, so there is some clickability in there, but, uh, not quite to where you want it to be. There's a weather radar as well. I haven't tested it for functionality, but uh, it's there. It turns on. All of the knobs appear to uh, do something. So, um, like I said, I have not used it yet, though. And then there's obviously our overhead panel with tons of different stuff to look at there as well. All of this is just as nicely uh, textured. There's the optional GNS 430. You can take that on or off if you want. But again, just everything looking very clear, very tidy, the way I would expect it to. Um, this side of the cockpit also has the uh, little uh, eyebrow light. Eyebrow. Um, oh, this side does too. So that's interesting. So on a different variant, the eyebrows... The eyebrow windows on this side are blanked off, but on the French variant, they are open, and you can see through them. Obviously, they've got that heavy tint to avoid sun. Um, you saw me when we first started our tour here with the sliding window. So that is openable on both sides, I believe. It is. So if you want to taxi with your window open, you can do that. Um, still not done. There's, there's a lot in this. Obviously, you've got your moving uh, armrests, but you can also slide your seat forward and aft, should you so choose. Not just ours, you can move our first officer seat forward and aft, like so. Um, this guy's seat, you can move forward and aft. This guy's seat, you can rotate 90 degrees over to the partially functional navigator station. I say partially because the FMS appears not to function, but all of the backup instruments here do. Um, there's lighting that we can add to these guys. So we got like a floodlight. And then a backlight for the circuit breakers, which are unfortunately not functional, but uh, they exist. There's a little weird... Uh, is that an octagonal? How many sides are there? I'm not counting. But a weird octagonal shape. Normally, at least from what I've seen, uh, circuit breakers are circular both on the breaker and on the mount, but whatever. But again, you've got nice functioning um, controls. So, you know, if we get like a proper integrated multi-crew or if you use one of the mods out there and you want to have like three people simultaneously flying this aircraft, that is uh, an option. Um, I would imagine this seat saw a lot more time back in the uh, days 50 years ago when flight engineers were a more prevalent thing and FADEX and all of that stuff didn't exist. 
Now it just seems more like a radio operator panel who can also see how high and how fast you're going in what direction. But um, We'll come back to the rest of the overhead panel when we do a startup. Um, in the meantime, let's head down the stairs here and take a look at uh, what we've got in back. First of all, look at this. The sun shining through. I'm assuming that window there onto the wall. Amazing. I love it. Um, it's just a pretty standard cargo pod. Um, in fact, let's go back to the main cockpit. We'll open up that electronic flight bag again. And take a look at some of the stuff we can do. So we've got cargo lighting we can turn on. We can drop seats on the left, right side, or both. And then there's a whole bunch of these different uh, cargos. So you've got some MRAPs, um, an amphibious... Uh, Assault vehicle, another MRAP, some barrels, boxes, and pallets you can add in the rear. Um, if you've got hydraulic power on, you can actually lower the whole fuselage to make loading and unloading easier. Uh, reload flares. This aircraft does have a flare system. We will take a look at it once we're in flight, but that's this guy right here. Um, 64 flares initially, and then you've got your fire order, and that'll dump flares out of both sides of the aircraft. It's a neat little visual effect. Obviously, it serves no purpose. Flight Sim not even allowing weapons in their sim. So, um, the last option um, we'll look at again while we're in flight are the propeller vortices and propeller dust. I love them. Um, and they're toggleable. So, if you don't like them, you can shut them off and you'll never have to deal with them. But I like them. So, coming down again into the cargo bay, you can see we dropped our seats on the left-hand side and we now have the overhead lighting on. Um, again, detail. Damn good. Damn good detail. No business being this detailed, but it is. Um, oh, I forgot to open doors back here, but you can open either one of these doors either side as well, as well as the rear cargo door opens. We'll take a look at those in flight, because um, for the rear door, you need hydraulic power on. These will just open as is, but... Uh, I think that's it for the inside walk around we will uh head back into the main cockpit get the aircraft buttoned up and uh, walk through the startup procedure i'll see you guys there actually no we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna keep walking because i want you to see this uh transition look at that i mean come on man look at that so nice. Obviously, that's how the real aircraft is modeled, but I just, I like being able to just do that quick transition. They even modeled, you know, are those oxygen bottles down there? Or nitrogen bottles, maybe? I'm not sure. I say nitrogen because they're not green. I don't know what those are. Those could be hydraulic accumulators for all I know, but either way, they're modeled. Oh, I got the camera stuck. Ah, oh, shoot. Okay, well, I'm going to get unstuck and then we'll go to the startup. Okay, so a startup in the C-160. Let's uh, go full cold and dark on our quick states. And we'll walk through this as though we just hopped into a completely dark aircraft. So everything is off. Everything is shut. All of my settings have been reset. Um, we do have the GPU still on board. So we're going to use GPU initially here to get us started. We're going to come up to our overhead panel. And like I said before, it is kind of a lengthy, a little bit more complex start process. But once you do it once, you'll you'll figure it out. So we're going to center you, center you, and then we're going to come back. This is our ground power. And then we're going to align our battery. Battery 2 will go to the main. Then we're going to shut you up because you're loud and annoying. The position and anti-collision lights will both come on. Uh, formation lights look like they're already on. That's fine. Next, we'll come up to our fuel system. And we're going to want to turn on our pumps. So uh, this threw me out for a little bit initially, and it still kind of does. These A, Bs, and Cs are your fuel tanks left and right side. Um, so you're pulling fuel from here, pumping it through here, and to wherever else it needs to go. So we're going to open up the gates from the tanks. Open up the gates to each pump. Then once they're open, we'll turn on our pumps. One, two, three, and four. And that should be sufficient fuel flow to get us started here. 
Next up, we're going to start the right hand engine first. We're going to come over to our APU panel. We're going to open that air inlet once this green light comes on. That lets you know that you're good to start. I'm going to shut bleed air off on the APU initially. Um, just let it come up and stabilize. And we'll monitor our APU. There's no oil pressure gauge. There's just a low pressure light. So you just have oil temp and uh, exhaust gas temp with your RPM. And obviously once we're stabilized out at 100%, we'll be good to start. While the APU is coming up, we want to make sure that our cabin valve for the APU is shut, which it is. That's what we want. So we don't want to be pulling air for anything other than to start. So we're now stabilized at 100% on the APU. We'll turn bleed air on. Next up, we're going to come to our engine starting panel. We're going to move this switch into the down condition for startup. Turn on our four turboprop fuel, fuel pumps, unguard our switch, and move this to the start condition. Now, the I, I like the initial startup rotation. It does jump for a minute, but this is good. And then it spins for a little bit and spins a little too fast. And then it does this. Ready, 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 and... There it is. It does that, and it just looks weird. Um, but you throw fuel in, engine will light off, and then eventually you get a nice smooth looking engine rotation for the most part. There's little weird lights and tessellation issues. But for the most part, it's a relatively smooth uh, startup after that. So light extinguished, switch back to neutral, regard, and then just repeat that same process for the left side. Fuel pumps on, switch off, or unguarded, start switch on, and we'll monitor this time. So we've got rotation in the first engine. I'm gonna come out a little bit. Oil temperatures in the green, oil pressures on the rise. I've already got fuel introduced, so it should automatically light off. Normally you wouldn't do that on a real aircraft, uh, but I've only got one bind for my mixture, and this is flight sim. Oil pressure is now in acceptable range. There's light off. Engine's accelerating. Oil pressure's in the green now. Watching our temps. Oil pressure's still in the green. a good light off. Starter coming off, switch closing, startup switch shutting. We're on bleed air now for the engine, so we'll shut off bleed air for the APU. Let the APU run for a little bit uh, to let it cool down. Come back over to our uh, EFIS panel. Normally you would have set this up to uh, align first and foremost, but uh, because it's not fully implemented, you can uh, it aligns pretty quick, just a couple of minutes. Okay, so both engines started now. We're going to come back up to our overhead panel. And we want to get electrical power from something other than... Oh, shoot. I just killed the ground people out there. <laughs> Whoops. So the reason we started the uh, right engine first... Is because... Uh, well, if you look at the prop arc and the big white danger line... And then you look at where the GPU is connected... Yeah, somebody would have died, um, but that's okay. So we'll come back to our EFB. Actually, no, we need to go to the overhead panel first. This would have been done partially before. So what we would have done, let's pretend we're started only on engine number two right now. Generators three and four would go to the lines. You would turn battery one to the main system and we could have run off of the APU generator and disconnected ground power when we were on APU power. So, that in mind, we'll disconnect the GPU now, which we would have done before, but again, we'll just 
do that now. Then we would have started engine two, or engine number one, and done the same thing. Generators one and two on, and then we can disconnect the APU generator because we don't need it anymore. Now the APU is run for long enough to where it's cooled down a little bit, so we can shut it down. We'll leave the door open for just a minute or two while it spools, or while it despools, I should say. And you can see you also have, if you wanted to easy start the APU, you could do that there. Last thing we'll do is remove the wheel chocks. And that should be it. I can show you guys the door, the rear doors really quick. So you got the left hand side door open, that rear ramp coming down, and that upper door coming up. And then in flight, the ramp will transition to a center position, central position. But that's the startup in the transol. We'll send props home to full idle. Shut our APU door and we should be good to taxi. Watch that taxi light swing down. Very nice. All right, we're good to taxi. I will uh, catch up with you guys once we're on the act. It looks like a. Oh my god! Look at the look at the rate of the shadows approaching. Oh my god! Is this Grand Theft Auto? What what's happening? Dude, that GTA rate sunset. I'm gonna race this crap. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. I'm not gonna give you guys shadow. No, we are. Anyway, I will catch up with you guys once we're on the uh, approach for uh, or on the threshold for our runway. All right, and with our race against the turboprop lost, or against the turboprop, against the shadow lost, we will take our turboprop into the air. This will give me a chance also to show you guys the uh, propeller vortices uh, before we get rolling, and then obviously once we're in the air as well. Um, a very real phenomenon that does happen on a lot of turboprop aircraft to varying extents. Um, I don't think it's modeled perfectly on this airplane, but it's modeled period, which is more than you get on a lot of other aircraft. I also like, I love, I love how bouncy this thing is. Look at this. I mean, it's a big, heavy, lumbering cargo airplane. You would expect the nose gear to bounce like that, so. Okay, poorly lined up on a departure runway. I want you guys to watch the left engine as I throttle it up and watch the tips of the prop blades. Ready? Here we go. You see that? So that's a little baby propeller vortice -y. And what's really cool about them is as the aircraft accelerates that vortice will actually make its way all the way along the nacelle of the turboprop and then actually make its way over the leading edge of the aircraft. Uh, I want to have a little party trick with the EFB. You can either turn it uh, on or off with a single push, but if you double click, it puts the bracket on. How about that, huh? That's pretty neat. So, from the cockpit, let's get nice and lined up here. All right, standing on the brakes. Let's run up the motors. Props in the full condition. Can you guys hear like the little rocks or like creaking of the airframe while we're under heavy load? I absolutely adore that. All right, there's about 50%. Let's come off brakes and add the rest of our power in. back on our yoke. Airborne, tap of the brakes, you're coming up. A little bit of a crosswind today too, it feels like. There's those prop vortices going down the whole length of the nacelle like I promised. We'll get a big
big, big, big climb out here. Which empty should be no problem for the transol. Let's see if we can catch some of that sun. We are not going to catch any of that sun yet. There's those formation lights I mentioned earlier along the uh, length of the wing and uh, tail of the aircraft. Looking relatively good, in my opinion. Even though they are 2D objects. I also have the air-to-air -air refueling probe lights on as well. So we'll go ahead and gain a little bit of altitude here. There's the sun. We'll gain a little bit of altitude here. Get some flight impressions on the transol. See how it recovers from certain stalls. And then uh, we'll do a tactical approach. No, we'll look at the flares, then we'll do a tactical approach and land. All right, we're getting ready to round out 12,000 feet. We'll start our uh, stall trials here, starting out with a very normal wings level power on stall. It's going to take a pretty good uh, angle to get this aircraft to start losing speed since we are empty. So we'll pitch up to about 30 degrees on our ladder. Air speed's dropping, increasing back pressure. For reference, that's our angle. Increasing back pressure, there's the stall horn. Increasing back pressure, right yoke. And there goes the nose, still back on the stick. Let's go into recovery. And we'll immediately transition into a Yahoo stall, is what I think I'm going to officially call it, where we uh, completely and totally do the wrong thing. So we're going to go for 45 degrees nose up this time. And as we're hitting that stall envelope, We'll uh, throw in some controls that you shouldn't do to see if we can get a more dramatic stall out of the aircraft. That's closer to 50 degrees there, but there's your reference. Okay, stalling. Left wing wants to go. We'll go left rudder, left aileron. Still pretty docile, so we'll go into recovery. And we'll transition back into a what are you doing stall I need a better name um, where we will cut one of our engines entirely not like shut it off but just reduce the thrust output and do that same process so there is 45 degrees nose up 50 degrees approaching stall Left engine to idle. Hard over, right rudder, hard over. Or sorry, left rudder, left aileron. And you know, it's uh, mostly forgiving. And this isn't anything we couldn't pull ourselves out of for sure. As far as responsiveness of the airframe, it uh, lumbers like you would expect a big uh, cargo aircraft to do. There's our ramp in the mid-air drop position with the paratrooper doors open as well. Should we elect to, uh, come on flight some elect to do that. You might have also noticed the additional noise increase and the subsequent decrease. Last thing we'll look at is the flares. Again, you unguard that switch, move it into the down position, and hit the fire order button. There are your flare dispensaries. We'll do 
one more salvo. First set looks like it missed its mark. As far as inverted flight goes, it'll do it, but it won't do it happily. Um, there's a lot of uh, dihedral on these wings, which means they're going to want to consistently return to level flight if possible, but uh, it can be done as far as maintaining inverted flight. I don't know. I wouldn't recommend it. But there you go. Next we'll get turned around and set up for our tactical approach. We're obviously overhead the field now, so we're going to have to circle around a little bit. Got those dag brakes out, I'm sure you saw. Help us get things slowed down. Looking for, I believe it's 160 or 140 knots. It's going to be our first uh, flap inclination. And we're actually going to trim the aircraft really high nose up for that uh, initial flare out as well. real nice at the sunset, doesn't it? All right, we'll add some power back in. I want to maintain uh, right around this altitude for a tactical approach. It's not going to be perfect. We're about 5,000 AGL, I think, uh, field elevation was just over 5,000 MSL, and we're just over 10,000 MSL now. And we're going to lose all of this altitude, and hopefully have a smooth landing to tell for it. Alright, power's coming off. Try and maintain more back pressure. Start trimming the airplane nose high if I can. Watch my vertical speed as well as the nose pitch. Here we go, gear coming down. And here comes our first few notches of flaps. I cannot see the field. little bit of power just to keep us aloft but we do want to essentially be flying right at that envelope of stalling because we're going to regain all of this speed momentarily as soon as flights and decides to unfreeze of course that is all right this is probably as good as a spot as any let's nose her in die breaks out we're completely we're super far to the right let's see if we can't save this Looking for one four zero. There goes our shadow. Right on the limit of our st stall or our flap speed. And we'll begin a nice big long flare now, just past the touchdown zone. Maximum effort braking once we hit the ground. A little bit off the runway, that's fine. We're a versatile airplane. Crosswind definitely caught me out. Didn't help that I wasn't lined up nicely either. So there's a max braking effort and a power back to bet. This aircraft is power back capable. Um, it's not C-130 levels of uh, performance, but uh, it'll do it. I'm 
and it usually runs out of steam. So, that is C160 Trans. I'll leave in a little demo of the uh, prop dust for you guys as well. That's nothing too spectacular, it just makes a nice uh, aesthetic cloud of dust on the ground behind the airplane. We can, uh, well, yeah, that's, that's a pretty good demo there. Let's pull off in the dirt here just a little bit so I can show it to you. We'll uh, take out this taxiway alpha sign. There you go, there's your prop dust. Again, toggleable off as well as with the um, prop vortices. Throttle them up, you get more dust. Throttle them down, you get less. So, the one, um, and it's strictly a visual thing, but it might make a difference for some of you guys out there um, that I think does need to be worked on with the Transol. And I'm sure we'll be at a later uh, update. Let's go ahead and stop here. Hit the park brake. Heading into the cockpit is the throttles. We'll talk about the throttles real quick and then we'll end the video. Um, so where the throttles are sitting right now is actually in the beta position. And I think it's actually in what on the real aircraft is a full beta position. And I say this because if you watch my left throttle as I advance it forward, it hits right around there. And then that little flap, that little flap lever opens. So I think on the real aircraft, this is idle. And I think all of this is the beta range. When I go into beta, it kind of just like hyper extends the throttle a little bit more. So that's the one, uh, I guess, bigger grip I do have about this airplane. Other than that, I, I really like it. There's nothing else for me to complain about. So that's the C-160 Transol by Azure Poly. Um, definitely a good grab if you're into military or civilian um, cargo transportation. I think this is a pretty widespread aircraft, but nonetheless, it's going to do it for me for this video, you guys. Thank you very much for watching. I do dearly appreciate it as always. I will see you in the next one, and until then, take it easy.